Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeves, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Laura Bray. Hi, Laura. Hi, Sue. It's lovely to speak to you today. And I've got a bio here for Laura. Laura Bray is an embroidery artist and fabric designer. She lives in the Pacific Northwest, and that's in America, um, USA, with her data scientist husband, their 13-year-old daughter, and a neurotic guinea pig named Oreo. She believes tea should be hot, floss smooth, and needles sharp. And you can read about her creative adventures and purchase PDF embroidery patterns on her website, Laura Bray Designs, where she is trying to build a community one stitch at a time. So, and I have to say, I really like Laura's website. It's really nice, Laura. And you've got a really interesting blog as well, which we'll come back to. I've got a few questions about your blog to talk about. And this idea of building a community one stitch at a time. So that's all really excellent. And as I say, the best place for um, you to follow Laura is at her website, laurabraydesigns.com. And she's also got a really nice monthly newsletter as well. And the link for that is in the show notes and all of Laura's social media links and her email address and all the other places that you can follow and find Laura. So welcome again, Laura. Thank you. Now then, before we get started with your stitchery story today, Laura, would you like to share with us what you're working on and what's got you excited? Well, right now I'm working on a personal challenge to stitch with 50 people before I turn 50 in November this year. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a little bit of a scary number for me, and I decided that I needed to ease the pain a bit by giving myself something else to think about. So... um, And it's been really fun because some of the people that I'm stitching with I know and are friends, but I've also put calls out to my social media, so I'm meeting people that I've never met before in coffee houses to sit and stitch with them, and they'll bring their grandmother's embroidery, and sometimes they don't know how to stitch, and I'll teach them. Sometimes they'll teach me. um, I learned about cut work embroidery Uh a couple weeks ago. So it's been a great learning experience. I think probably I'll end up turning it into a book at some point, but it's been a really fun way to take my mind off that big age number that's coming in November for me. Oh, do you know, I think that's a really, really good idea though. And we were just laughing at the start there. Yeah, this this 50 thing looms. It's, what I really like about this idea is the fact that you're meeting people, as you say, who might not have stitched or you wouldn't have stitched with them and I thought it was interesting that some of them can't stitch and you've helped them people have helped you I think that's just wonderful how that's worked out really good have you done quite a few already then um I have six under my belt so far so it's January that's a pretty good start yeah um I think we spend so much time online and in social media and this was a way for me to be social without being online to get out go to a new coffee shop meet some new people or really connect and have a real conversation with people um, in person, looking them in the eye. And I think that doing the stitching takes a little bit of the pressure off meeting somebody new. Um, You can stitch and it kind of the, the silences make it a bit easier if you're pretending that you're trying to work through a French knot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's, it does take the pressure off, doesn't it? Because you've got a shared interest and mm-hmm. a shared thing to be be involved with. And you don't have to maintain the eye contact all the time. And in fact, it was interesting because my um, guest of last week, Tina, Tina Francis, she gets involved with bereavement groups. So she helps facilitate bereavement groups who sit and stitch. And she says the same thing there. It's because people have got something to do with their hands and they're looking 
at their work quite often. You can still talk without looking. And she said, so then people have found it easier to talk about some of their you know, very painful emotions around grief and bereavement whilst they're doing the stitching. So it's interesting that you've mentioned um, a similar idea, obviously in a far more cheerful situation. Yeah. And sometimes you can just be quiet, can't you? It's that comfortable silence. You can just sometimes stitch without saying anything at all. Yeah, it's very meditative. I found it's a great tool when I'm with my teenage daughter as well. Sometimes we've had some hard conversations over stitching um, and it just takes the intensity away a little bit. And teenagers don't always read your facial (laughs) expressions correctly. And Mm -hmm. if they're looking down, that kind of takes that that piece out of a sometimes volatile conversation. Yeah, that's a really good approach. A good aspect as well I haven't thought about that um yeah well I, I suppose I do the same with my son we've been doing some lego we've got this lego techniques on the go at the moment so um yeah we're kind of pouring away over the diagrams and the book there and we're kind of working out what to do next but, and yeah and you do you finish up having a conversation and I know I find when we're on a term so I'm a member of the embroiderers guild our branch there's and there's about 10 of us so it's a small group when we all take some work and, you know, do stitching and things. And sometimes there's a lot of conversation goes on. And then all of a sudden you can tell when we're really busy, we're really concentrating on what we're doing because then it'll go silent. And it'll, it can be kind of five, ten minutes. Then somebody will kind of like then say, oh, right, are we having a cup of tea or something like that? Because somebody feels then they've got to talk. You know, they can't have this silence anymore. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. Right. So I really liked that idea of that project. And then the social media side of things I think we can talk about that possibly a bit later on but that's a a really interesting aspect as well where you're purposefully questioning what you are working on in terms of how much time you're spending online and with social media and so on so um, I'd I'd like to come back to that point because I found that very very interesting so Laura would you just like to share with us therefore you're obviously working on your, you know, running a business around your creativity and your embroidery. So how did you first get interested in embroidery and textile art? And what were the, the path really from being taught to deciding to run this as a business? Well, um, I started doing embroidery when I was about 10. It was the 70s and I got a super groovy mushroom pattern and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, all oranges and browns and I wanted to learn how to do it. (laughs) And so my mom, who did cruel work at the time, sat down and showed me and I stitched so much that first couple of months that I ended up getting headaches and eye strain and (laughs) needed to wear glasses briefly because I got so obsessed with the idea of stitching. Um, But of course, then the teen years and boys came and I put my hoop aside and got sidetracked. Yeah. Um, And really, my creativity in general had been sidetracked in high school I thought I wanted to do something creative like fashion design and had an art teacher tell me that I had no talent so I ended up going to school I got an MBA I was a business consultant for many years and then I had my daughter when I was 35 and decided that I wanted to reconnect with my creativity and as I was doing that I applied my business skills and was able to create a business that allowed me to stay home and raise my daughter, um, re-explore my creativity, and um, actually bring a little bit of extra money into the household at the same time. And that eventually morphed into um, more focused with watercolor, drawing, and then embroidery. Right. That's a lovely story. And there's quite a few guests who I've spoken to where their current kind of creative business is their second career you know we've had quite a few people who've been teachers and um, I guess again last week she had a similar background to me working in computers and project management and so on so it, it is quite it's a tale a story that I think is really quite heartwarming as well in that and quite often that you know the catalyst has been a child on the way um, and then we just kind of think well do I want to carry on with this crazy corporate life or do I want to do something else I mean I 
escaped the, the corporate rat race when I had my child. Um, but I just work for myself, providing online services and podcasting services, nothing to do with my embroidery. That's not a, a business a business thing <laughs> for me, isn't my embroidery. So Laura, how did how did you get involved or get more interested in the community side of things because you've mentioned that quite a few times so obviously you, you're running your business but you keep emphasizing this community aspect was there any particular thing that sparked that off well that's an interesting question and if I really think about it coming from a business background and I owned my own business uh, doing consulting um, I did a lot of networking during that time, and right. that's a piece that I really enjoyed, um, building a business network of people. Um, and then social media came in, and I used that a lot when my daughter was young just to, you know, mm. cling by my fingernails to mm. have companies <laughs> and not talk to a three-year-old. You yeah. know, you wanted to have some kind of adult interaction, but I found that I was relying too much on social media. Um, it certainly has its good points and it does build communities in a way. But I think that sometimes we're calling our communities now these online areas and really we still, we're pack animals by nature. I think human beings need to be in physical contact with other human mm, beings. Yes, yes. And I think it's important that we connect on on that level in and within our own communities. I, I moved two years ago from Southern California to a small town in Washington state. And I really love the community, the small town feel. And I want to continue that and teach other people that they can use embroidery as a way to connect with like-minded people. Yeah. And we might as well talk about the social media side of things now, because, yeah, you're right. We we talk, you know, people talk about now about building a community online and building a, a tribe in social media, et cetera, et cetera. And as you say, to a certain extent, yes, we can connect with other people and organize a group and so forth. But quite often it can be fairly soulless or meaningless i mean sometimes you do met some lovely you know don't take me wrong i've met some fantastic people online doing this podcast i've spoke to so many people i would never have spoken to i've had brilliantly interesting conversations with them um and it's been super but then you, you, you catch yourself as we were saying kind of aimlessly scrolling through some group where everyone's whinging and why you think no actually i'm not being in this group anymore i'm coming out of this group you mm -hmm. don't you don't want the destructive and negative side of things do you mm -hmm. now you, you mentioned about taking a, a detox from social media so do you want to kind of share a bit with us about you know what your thoughts and experiences about that was laura well, in um, November of 2018, I decided to take a month. Possibly, I had told myself I would start with a month and possibly do it till the end of the year mm -hmm. and go off social media and really just focus on creating, uh, working on my website and working on newsletters. I was surprised by, first of all, I'm, I'm not a person who spends hours and hours. I've never spent hours and hours scrolling, but I knew that I was starting to spend more time than I was comfortable with online versus living life. Um, and I was surprised by how much that had become a habit mm. um, for me when I stopped because the first few days I kept reaching for my, I'd wake up and reach for my phone to scroll through Instagram and it was not <laughs> on my phone anymore. Yeah. Um, so I was really doing it because I was getting to a place where my daughter is getting older. She needs me less. And I'm starting to look at what the next stage in my life is. And I was, I felt like I was getting a little bit confused, um, seeing so much information and seeing so many other lives being lived out that I wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to connect with what I really wanted. And so I felt that if I could turn the noise off for a bit and be really introspective and maybe explore in my studio more than explore online, um, that I would find what I was looking for. And I really did. Um, I also was interested from a business standpoint because I do have an MBA to see, you know, one of my excuses for being on social media was, well, I run a business mm -hmm. and I can't run a business without social media. And I actually increased my sales without my social media because I was sending out newsletters. And those are the people who like my work so much. Yeah. 
yeah. they're willing to let me into their inbox every month. Mm. And um, I was producing really high quality work because I had the time to do that. And I was doing more drafts of my illustrations and my patterns and refining them and refining them. Not that I think I was doing poor work before, mm. but I was taking it to the next level just with the amount of time that I had saved. Yeah, and that's quite a powerful point to have realized, isn't it? Because, you know, the thing thing now is, as you say, oh, if you're in a business, you've got to be on social media, this, that, and the other. And then you stopped and the sky didn't fall down and the world didn't end. But what you were was more purposeful with the time that you spent online, I think, and mm -hmm. more strategic in what you were doing while you were there and then definitely keeping away from all the irritating distractions so yeah that's really interesting and, and I, I actually read your blog post about it a nice detailed blog post um, ab about your experience so that was a really interesting viewpoint to, to read yeah it's an insidious habit it definitely does creep up so the time that you spent online what, what were the different things you were doing, do you think, that made the difference to the sort of results you were seeing? Well, like I said, I, w I was putting more effort into writing more regularly on my blog and doing yeah. my newsletters, but I was focusing more on using Pinterest, which I read a lot about this. I didn't have a problem with Pinterest, and Pinterest, a lot of people consider less social media and more search engine, mm -hmm. um, simply because there's not a lot of interaction on Pinterest. Um, you don't get the same buzz because somebody shared your pin that you do with that little heart that you get on Instagram. Right. Interesting. Yes, yes. And for a long time, I had ignored my Google Analytics that most of the traffic I was getting was coming from Pinterest and I wasn't even trying um, so I was, you know, just having things automatically pin when they would load onto my website. And so I wanted to experiment and play there because I felt that I wouldn't get a sucked in. And I found really great success there. I was able to increase views, which led to a lot more clicks on my website, which I think I, I had more newsletter signups, which is in my marketing funnel where I want to get people. If you're in social media and out there, you want to slowly drive them towards becoming a customer if you're doing it for business. And this first step, I think, the the step before selling is getting them on your newsletter because those people are showing an interest in your work. Exactly. Yes, that's true. So, and it's a good way to just build my business. It, for me, it's not a platform that I get sucked into. And I think that that's what people need to look at is what works for them. What is really, if they're going to be honest, not what you're you have the most fun on if you're doing this for a business, you need to look at what is really meeting your objectives for your business. And then is it something that you can monitor and control and not get sucked into? Um, and so for me, Pinterest does that. Instagram, I can lose hours on. I'll tell you what is interesting though. Very often when talking with people about say websites or blogging and that kind of thing people will often say oh I don't have time to blog I, oh no I, I can't keep it up to date and now there are some some guests that I've spoken to have got lovely blogs and and it's a real key thing for them and, and others will just no no I don't have a blog I, I haven't got time but when you think about the amount of time that people possibly Instagram would probably seem easier isn't it it's like almost that easier option of yeah, it's easier to scroll and post some pictures up and put some text, et cetera, et cetera. And it may, may feel like blogging is harder work. But as you kind of experienced, once you stop the aimless scrolling, you have the time to then be more purposeful and get some blog posts because blog posts do will drive traffic all the time. It shows your point of view. It shows what you're working on. It just gives that oomph, doesn't it, really? It gives that more background, more detail and more information. So that's a really interesting experience there for you, Laura. Well, Instagram is microblogging, and so why not do it on your own platform <laughs> where you own the content because you don't own it once it goes on Instagram and then you become the slave to their algorithms mm. as well as you're giving them free content. So why would I give another business person my free content when I should be building the content on my own website for my own business? 
Yeah, it's it is so important. The all these places do brilliant to help us get some wider attention, but ultimately mm-hmm. we do always need to be driving back to the place that we own, which is our website, uh, and yeah. then building that funnel with newsletters or however however it is. You know, that's our shop window to the world, isn't it? Regardless of what, whether we're selling embroidery or podcasting services or mentoring or whatever it is. Well, thank you for sharing those insights into Pinterest. So what I would really like to find out a bit more about, let's look at some techniques, Laura. What would you say your, your favourite technique or style is that, that, really, that you really like and enjoy? Well, my favourite stitch is French knots. And <laughs> before we started recording, we talked briefly. Yes. You're working on a project of that. <laughs> so you're probably like, why are you saying that? But uh, <laughs> I, at first I had you know, a lot of difficulty getting them tight enough, but I did a pillowcase project a few years ago that the flowers needed a lot of French knots. And I found I became, one of the things I like about doing embroidery is that it gets me into a bit of a meditative state Mm -hmm. and French knots really get me there (laughs) really quickly if I'm doing a lot of them. So, because they take a lot more focused attention. Um, So, That's why I like that. It it kind of slows me down and connects me with my work um, to do the French knots. As for my style, and I think that one of when I was rediscovering embroidery, some of the first artists that I found were Jenny Hart and Amy Ray, who were both kind of the forerunners of the modern embroidery movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Jenny Hart, I think her tagline is not your grandmother's embroidery. (laughs) And for me that I kind of had put embroidery, maybe I was just remembering the 1970s mushrooms, but (laughs) it felt like, oh, well, that the patterns aren't patterns that interest me. But with these new modern embroidery patterns, it was everything from like tattooed women to flowers. And while I'm not quite uh, that modern, I do like that I can use my own illustrations and then instead of painting them or coloring them with marker, I can use thread to bring them to life. Right. Yes, because you, you, you're also an, an artist as well. So that's a really good combination there isn't it then yeah and this uh this french knot piece i'm doing yeah i quite like french knots it's a good job really because this is just really loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of french knots the whole thing is going to be french knot but it just fits the style of the image which i'm working from i do like them i know a couple of my friends hate them i think french knots is that kind of love hate thing but yeah, I know what you mean about that almost meditative state because I've been doing quite a lot recently, obviously, and it's been very calming, especially over the new year, to just sit, think about nothing really other than French knots. Or I have been listening to a few audio books as well, actually, while I've been doing it. I really like I like the texture too yes. because for me, one of the things about embroidery is I love to run my hands over a finished piece and feel the texture. And French knots, there's just nothing better than a whole section of yes. French knots. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we'll run our fingers through the French knots. Yes. Like. <laughs> Right, moving swiftly on. So, Laura, <laughs> what would you say then has been a high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far? Um, really, it's I, I really enjoyed teaching my daughter to stitch, and yeah. now I'm continuing that with teaching people through my Fifty Stitches project. It's it's introducing something that is considered old fashioned that a lot of people maybe have some really touching memories and soft spots in their heart for, but have disregarded and written off as kind of not modern enough. Hmm. And I'm really enjoying bringing that and the peace it brings, the mental peace it brings to people. But I really, my daughter, I started to teach her how to stitch when she was three, just with cardboard um, that had holes punched into it. And she oh, laced yes. yeah. And we've gradually moved up. And really the day that she showed me her um, first piece that she had used real cloth and a needle and she had actually drawn the pattern herself Mm -hmm. um, was really touching and kind of one of my high points in my creative journey. Yeah. And that's so nice to be able to pass our skills on. And for some reason, over a number of years, 
we seem to have lost that passing things on to our children which is a bit of a shame generally as society i think crafters and people in textile artists are, are still passing those skills on but it's interesting you say that people have got this idea that it's like old-fashioned and yet when you look there's some fantastic contemporary embroidery which is anything but old-fashioned i think people just haven't come back and looked have they and it's no. you know the community around stitch and embroidery we all know there's some fantastic things going on in every range from traditional gold work ecclesiastical stuff modern things you know textile art it's just an amazing range but people don't know that do they unless they actually come and look or somebody like you or all of us encourages people to say well look this is what I've been doing come and have a look come and sit come Mm -hmm. and sit with me and let's see what you can do and and I'm trying to encourage you know several friends as well to uh, get a bit more involved and just spend a sit and really spend some time on yourself please you know never mind everybody else your family will survive without you for an hour Please yes. just do something. <laughs> Try this. If you don't like it, fine. Go find something else. But do something for yourself, please. <laughs> yeah, it's real. I'm really attached to the idea of creativity as self care. And when I teach my embroidery classes in person, I make sure that the people bring. You know, I serve them tea. I take care of them. I want them to really relax and enjoy the time and make it the equivalent of going to a spa, which, you know, mm-hmm. maybe it can't be going to a spa, <laughs> yeah. but um, it, it's really, I want it to be this peaceful, quiet time for them um, where they're taken care of and they start to realize that they can take care of themselves in that way. Yeah. it's For me, it's always a special treat. You know, I'm a single mum, so you finish up doing everything. You've got to do everything. You need to spend time with your child. You, you're running a business. There's clients to keep happy and and all the things that we need to do I, I, I volunteer for various things and so then you think to yourself hang on a minute I've come last again in my list of things to do and so it's a real special treat for me to actually spend some time and get on with some of my embroidery projects and as I say I've got about three looming deadlines for either the end of January or the end of February so I've got three things on the go that are all going to be done by the end of February so hence the uh, getting on with the French Knots project and it's just <laughs> just really nice isn't you think well hmm shall I do the ironing or shall I get on with my projects oh what a surprise I'm going to get on with my projects <laughs> well an embroidery lends itself it doesn't make a big mess um it's not like you're painting or something yeah, yeah. a little bit of thread it's pretty portable so it is easy to sneak a little once you understand all of that it's pretty easy to sneak a 30 minute session in and kind of renew yourself yeah, and it's it's been quite nice. Him. My son's been working on this big uh, Lego Techniques set, which I've, so the the uh, my living room floor is just covered in <laughs> piles of Lego everywhere. So what with his Lego all over the floor, and then I've got my corner um, where where I can put my really nice light and things. So and that's just all around the floor. There's all the bits of thread I just keep throwing on the floor and picking up. So it's like, well, <laughs> our living room we're we're living in it, you know. So he's been doing his Lego and I've been doing my embroidery, and then we've been chatting. And do you know, it's been lovely. So there's been no screens involved. It's been really really nice. That sounds cozy. <laughs> it, you know, it really has been. Now the other thing I'm always quite interested to hear everyone's experience about is. How, how do you organize your creative time? And particularly for guests such as yourself who are also running a business around your creativity. So, you know, how, how do you organize your creative time? Is there times when you think, oh, I don't really feel like being creative, but I've got all these other things or deadlines to do? You know, any, any kind of hints and tips and what your experience in that is, Laura, please? Well, that's really something I've been struggling with in one of my New Year's resolutions Mm -hmm. was to make more time for the creativity because when you do run a business based on your creativity, um, you start to, or I do at least, uh, I find myself, again, in front of the computer far too much Mm -hmm. instead of creating, um, as well as I start to turn everything I create into a piece of business, Mm -hmm. um, which... I I don't think was good for my creativity. So one of the ways I dealt with that aspect for all those other creative business people is I stopped thinking that everything I create is um, sellable. 
Um, so that's why I really started to drill down and focus on selling embroidery mm. and backed off on selling my illustrations and watercolor so much just because I'm still doing those, but I didn't want to make them turn into money so that I have an outlet where I'm just free to be creative without trying to make a product in at the same time. Now I think I have a lot more time for creativity, so I really have no excuse. I, my child goes, she's much older now yeah. and goes to school for a long time and has all kinds of other mm -hmm. activities. So I think one of the most important things that I can do is every evening lately, I've been laying out my project and everything I need so that in the morning when I'm ready to get started, I have everything and there's no excuse of, yeah, well, I don't know where the... <laughs> this is and oh but i'm going to have to drag that thing out and i don't really you know um so that's a big thing and i'm also making it a priority my energy is highest in the morning um after i send my daughter off to school i do not turn on my computer i don't look at my email i immediately go to my work my creative work and give myself an hour and tell myself i can stop even after 20 minutes, as long as I put a little bit of time. It's kind of like exercise where, yeah. you know, they always tell you to put your shoes out the night before. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and just tell yourself you'll just walk for 10 minutes and then it, it builds up. You can apply those same hints to building your creative muscles as well. You know, put the supplies out where you can easily accept, access them. And then promised yourself you're only going to do it for 10 minutes it doesn't have to be an all-day thing or hours long yeah and and you know that's that approach really is one of the main keys to actually achieving things so I go with a similar thing so there's various bits and pieces that I'm working on outside of client work so I'm, I'm working on a book project with a friend and I've got another I've, I'm creating some videos so it's too easy, isn't it? It's too, it's very easy to think to yourself, oh, I need all day. Oh, I haven't got all day. And so you don't get anywhere done. But if you were to say, right, I'm going to spend 30 minutes a day on my book project or 30 minutes a day writing my blog or whatever it is, it really, really does make a difference because at the end of the week, you've done two and a half hours. And usually once you start, you can't stop, can you? So you've done a, a lot right. more. And whereas if you were waiting for that perfect, perfect day where ooh, all I'm going to do today is blog or so or whatever it is, it never, ever happens. And so therefore, you never, ever get anything done. So really, really nice to hear how how successful you find that approach as well, Laura. You also, I also take Ernest Hemingway used to say that writing, he would always quit his writing session each day while he still had more to write. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that really helps too, because then you're motivated to get back at it when you have some time. So don't, don't let the well run completely dry while you're still feeling excited and thinking, Oh, you know, tomorrow I'm going to get this section done instead of pushing through that section right during right today, mm -hmm. put it off and enjoy the anticipation of knowing that it's waiting for you. Yeah, and that's really true as well. I know quite often I kind of think, oh, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm terrible for waking up early anyway, and I, I go running, but it's like, oh, right, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting on with, you know, there might have been something, you say, half, you know, half finished, I haven't finished yet. Well, and you do, you really look forward to getting on with it, don't you? Well, well, I certainly do. So I think there's a lot of very, very good advice in that particular statement as well, Laura. So, yeah, well, they're both really, really powerful ways of, managing creative time and I think both aspects haven't really been talked about very much so yeah I'm really I'm really pleased I asked you those questions thank you <laughs> <laughs> right as we start to look ahead now and obviously you've talked about your 50 stitches project and presumably your ongoing challenge with um, social media then have you any other future plans and projects that you, you might like just to share with us as we wrap up today Laura well, I'm working on another, it'll end up being another year-long project, and 
my local library has a seed library. And I've just since moving to Washington State and having more land have started dabbling in gardening. So Mm -hmm. I decided to take slow stitching to new levels. I know you've had guests on Mm -hmm. before who've discussed um, all of the benefits of slow stitching. But I am going to my local seed library, planting plants that I can later harvest and use them as natural dyes and dyeing my own embroidery floss and fabric and am going to make that kind of a year-long project where I really get in touch from start to finish with the piece and infusing some of the local produce even into my work as well as some cons, some spiritual concepts for me of things like blackberry juice makes beautiful purple dye, but it doesn't typically last. It Mm -hmm. it tends to fade and meditating on the impermanence and the way the pieces change because of the way the natural dyes are working are all things that I'm exploring right now. What a lovely project. And hopefully you'll be updating your blog with your progress on those. That's absolutely fascinating. Growing the seeds, harvesting the plants, making dye out of them and um, creating your own thread and fabric colours from that. That's just brilliant. I really, really like the sound of that project. So I shall be looking forward to reading your blog entries about that, Laura. I will be updating on a regular basis. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. Right. Well, thank you so much, Laura. It's been fantastic speaking to you. You've explained and shared some really interesting ideas with us today. And I'm sure everybody's been very fascinated to hear your experience, say back with the social media. I love your 50 Stitches project. And we were just saying before, maybe we'll have a Zoom session and we'll do an hour stitching together across not only the Atlantic, but across America as well. So halfway around the world, we, I think that would be quite nice, wouldn't it, for us to do that? I would love to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for sharing your stitchery story with us today. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's been absolutely brilliant. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories. 